Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, we're running a little bit behind today. Uh, on behalf of the American Enterprise Institute, I'd like to welcome you to a conversation we're going to have with Pamela Paul, the editor of the New York Times Book Review, um, about her recent book, How to Raise a Reader. Uh, she co-authored it with her colleague, Maria Russo. Uh, so much of raising children these days seems to be about what we don't want them to do, keeping them away from dangers, both real and virtual. No doubt this is a feature, uh, perhaps, and a bug of our helicoptering age. But I think this attitude often fails to promote a sense of independence in kids. Not only do they not know how to walk down the street by themselves, um, but they're also pretty much incapable of entertaining themselves, at least without a device in hand. Uh, so for reasons both selfish, parents need a break, and selfless, uh, we know this is an important life skill for them. I think the current situation is pretty untenable. Our kids have trouble with any kind of unstructured activity, but reading for pleasure is perhaps the activity that I think has suffered the most. According to a recent analysis of uh, the American Time Use Study, the share of Americans who read for pleasure has actually fallen by more than 30% since 2004. So if there is a way to reverse this trend, I think it will have to start with our children. And I can think of no one who can help us better uh, to learn how to share the joy of reading with children than Pamela. Uh, before rising to her current position, she was the children's book editor at the New York Times. Uh, she has three children herself. Um, and she's also the author of six books uh, and the host of the Book Review podcast. Uh, after Pamela talks about her research and her book for a little bit, uh, she and I are going to have a conversation, uh, and then we will open it up to questions from the audience. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Pamela. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me. And I will start by telling a story that kind of runs against my instincts um, and temperament, which is it's a kind of boastful story about my kids, and I'm more of the type uh, that generally really something terrible and embarrassing that my kids have done. Um, but I'm telling it for a reason. First of all, um, this is something that happened my last time uh, in DC. I came down for the National Book Festival over Labor Day weekend to help launch this book, How to Raise a Reader, and took the train down with my three kids and my husband. And we were on the train, and we got seated separately. So they were kind of scattered around. Um, but we were sort of passing things to them, snacks and whatnot. So I think it was clear that they were mine. But as I got up to leave the train and was kind of gathering my family, there was an older couple behind me. And the man stopped me and said, excuse me, are those your children? So usually that kind of fills me with fear. <laughs> like, oh no, what have they done? And so I said, you know, yes, a little bit tentatively. And he said, um, I just have to say uh, that I am so heartened to see that they were all reading their whole way down here, and they were reading actual books. Um, so I kind of thought, OK. Well, then his wife chimed in and said, I was just reading the most interesting article in the New York Times about this very subject. And she pointed to a piece that, you know, as you know, when you, when you have a book coming out, you'll often write a piece to launch it. And this was my piece uh, for the op-ed section of the Times called, I think it was called No Gold Star for Reading, um, about not rewarding reading, that reading in and of itself is the reward, and that, in fact, um, to reward re reading is counterproductive. Um, and so I couldn't resist. You know, it was my kind of my I have Marshall McLuhan right here moment. Uh, so I said I, I actually wrote that piece. Um, so it is, in fact, true. My kids are all readers. They are now 10, 13, and 14. Um, but the reason I tell that story is not especially to show off about them, uh, but because I wanted to relay what I think Naomi alluded to, which is that people are really panicked about kids reading. They are freaked out. And I think the reason why people are so afraid of kids reading is because not only the value of books, but of what it signifies, um, both for themselves and for our culture and for society. Um, for themselves, you know, for kids themselves, I think that it is unquestioned at this point that reading is important. There's a lot of research around it. We know uh, that reading is important to cognitive development. We know that it is tied to academic success. We also have research now that shows that reading improves executive function that it's closely tied to a child's social and emotional development. And my personal uh, opinion is that it also just makes us better human beings. Um, and so now people are very eager 
to have their kids uh, become readers. This really wasn't the case, I want to say, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, when I was coming of age, at that point, no one sort of trotted out their kid and said, she's such a reader. You know, if you think about the word bookworm, it's not exactly um, a, a, a massive compliment. People were more inclined to show off about a gymnast or a violin player or someone with sort of basic coordinated skills on a playing field none of which I had. Um, but now people really do um, want their kids to be readers. There are reading contests. There's all kinds of efforts um, on the local level uh, to get kids to read. And yet, um, as Naomi um, suggested, the research isn't necessarily um, that uh, strongly supporting that it, the fact that it succeeded. So I, I'll talk a little bit about how I came to write this book and then some of uh, the findings. Um, so this book started off as a digital guide for the New York Times. When I was demoted, as my kids see it, from children's books editor to editor of the book review in 2013 um, and hired uh, a new children's book editor, Maria Russo, I was asked by a group at the Times to create a kind of guide um, for the website. We had done guides, or other people at the time had done guides on things like how to meditate, which is a guide I've read several times, even though I have yet to try to meditate, um, and, and other guides about how to sort of live a better life. And they came to me and said, well, what kind of guide could we do for reading and books? And to me, this was the obvious answer, how to raise a reader, because it's something that I always wanted to do. And it's something that in my position as children's books editor and just as a parent of three kids, I knew that many parents wanted to do. So Maria and I got together. We created a digital guide. And it went online. And it went viral, as they say. And the questions and, and comments from parents flowed in. And one of the most common was, like, how do I print this out and turn it into a book? You would think that a guide about how to raise a reader should be a book. Um, and in fact, that's what we then did, which was to really expand on all of the uh, research that we had done and the advice we had and the recommendations for books that we had um, for kids. So we turned it into a book in short order. When I was the children's books editor, and even ongoing in this job now, um, I got a lot of questions from parents. And a lot of what we wanted to do in the book was to address those questions. And the questions can be very basic. Um, a lot of times, parents just come to me and say, you know, my kid is into puppies, but not sad stories. And he likes graphic novels. And he doesn't like blocks of text. And he hates photographs. What should he read? Um, so very specific requests for suggestions. But then there are the sort of bigger existential angst questions, like, what do I do? if my kid doesn't like to read? Or when should my kid start reading? Or my child's kindergarten teacher says that my child is two levels behind where he's supposed to be, and I don't know what to do about it. And then once kids learn to read, they worry about what if my child isn't choosing to read? What if he isn't reading enough? What if she says that reading is boring? What if she only wants to read graphic novels? What if ever since she got Instagram, she doesn't want to do anything else? So. What we perceived in these questions was that there are a lot of myths out there around reading about what makes a reader, um, what. Ah, yes. Um, I will move to the slide shortly. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about some of, uh, some of those myths. And I will now do it with a visual aid. First myth. Nothing is as important to raising a reader as reading aloud to your child. This is the thing that everybody knows that they are supposed to do. And in fact, it is true. You should read aloud to your child. And there are lots of ways in which you sort of do's and don'ts around how to, raise, how to read aloud to a child. But another interesting statistic that's just as powerful as reading aloud to your child is the number of books in your home. This is really important. It's not necessarily immediately obvious, but it's not tied to income or education level. So this isn't just something that people who have lots of money and therefore lots of books in their home have an advantage. This is something that anyone can do because, as we all know, books now, especially used books, are incredibly easy to acquire online. And you also can go to the library. What's interesting about it is that when you have books in your home, you're saying something about your family, about your family culture, which is that reading is prized. 
And it's also very hard, and I'm sure anyone here who has children knows that one of the most annoying things to hear from a child is, I'm bored. It's really hard to be bored if there are constantly books around you. And books not only in a library in the home, but books for each child if they don't have their own room, a bookshelf in a shared room. Book kids are acquisitive creatures. They like to collect. They like to own things. They should have a place for their own books that they manage on their own. But books should also be throughout the house. Books should be in the parlor. They should be wherever the television is, where the computers are. They should be in the kitchen where cookbooks can be and other books about food. They should be in the bathroom where everyone does a lot of reading if they're not on the iPad. Um, obviously, the former is better than the latter. Um, so it's really important to keep books in the home, to show that books are something that matters to you, and to give kids the opportunity to read. If you don't own the books and you go to the library and take out 20 or 30 books a week, make sure you have a constant rotating cast of books in there. Because another thing to remember about kids is they don't always know what they want to read. They're, not, they're still developing their interests. So take out books that you're not sure might interest them. Take out different kinds of books, books that are more visual, books that aren't subjects they might not be familiar with, to always allow them the opportunity to turn to a book. Another myth, the earlier a child learns to read independently, the better a reader he'll be for life. This is a myth that's really easy to believe because all parents think in terms of milestones, developmental milestones. It's natural for us to think the earlier they'll do something, the better they'll be. But the analogy I like to think of is shoelaces. If a child learns to tie her shoelaces at the age of four, it's not going to make her a better shoelace tire at the age of 25 than if she didn't learn until she was 10. And the same thing goes for reading. The age your child learns to read is not related to future reading or cognitive ability. Um, this is something that many countries in Europe know very well. Germany, Scandinavian countries don't even begin teaching reading until age seven or eight. And they don't do that because the research supports it. Because kids' brains aren't necessarily all able to do the kind of complicated decoding that reading requires. And that moreover, if you do start to teach reading at a very early age, at three or four or five, when a child isn't ready, they become frustrated, they become annoyed, they have negative feelings associated with reading, they think this is just something I'm not good at, this is not for me. And it leads to a lot of many years of anxiety and frustration that again, don't correlate well with a child who grows up and says this is something that I actually want to do with my free time. So, there is zero correlation. I can say, even just from personal experience of my three kids, the one who was reading the latest is the most ambitious and voracious reader of the three. Here's another myth. Reading the same book over and over means your child is stuck. So I can't tell you the number of parents who, first it was Harry Potter was sort of the guilty thing. You know, my kid just will not stop reading Harry Potter. She doesn't want to read anything else. Now it's Dogman, which people think, oh no, it's even worse. It's these sort of terrible graphic novels. I have some reassurance on that front. There is actually a lot of good to reading over and over. And there is a reason that kids do it. And it changes for every age. But it's true for adults, too. So with babies and toddlers, they actually benefit from you reading those books over and over again. They learn to recognize the words. Word recognition is a big part of reading. They learn to memorize the text, another big part of reading. If your child has memorized board books, and this goes back a little bit to always having books around and to family culture, then when you go out and you run errands, you tuck in board books into your bag so that when you end up in the inevitable moment that happens to all parents where your kids are bored and waiting around, whether it's on the line to the grocery store or at a doctor's office, Rather than do the easy thing and pull out a phone and hand it to your child, you take out some board books. And even if you're occupied, if they've memorized that book, they can read it to themselves. And then again, that builds confidence and a feeling that I am a reader from a, the you know, very early age. And then older children benefit emotionally and cognitively from rereading books. For kids, and I certainly can say this from personal experience, having been a very bookish child myself, when you read, the characters become your friends. They're your social life. These are people you're familiar with. The worlds they live in, whether they're realistic or fantastical, are places that you want to be. They're comfort zones. They're places for fantasy, but also for a feeling of belonging. And so it's good for kids to reread. 
And I think as any adult knows, when you reread a book as an adult, you get something different from it each time. So if you reread, if you read Budenbrooks, for example, at age 25, and then you reread it at 40, once you've sort of been through many of the things that Thomas Mann describes in that book, you actually have experienced some of that yourself, of parenthood and loss and, and um, the passing of generations that you might not have appreciated when you were 25, and you get more out of it. If you think about a child who is developing at every moment, what they read six months from now, if they're rereading something, they're going to read it in a different way than they previously read it. They're going to get more out of that story. They're going to see new things in it because they are not only getting to know it better, but they are in a different place themselves. So it's really good for kids to reread and not worry that they're stuck. Another myth, parents should work with their children starting in preschool to teach them how to read and help them progress year by year. So this again feels like an obvious, well of course, because we all hear about parent involvement and we know that we're supposed to be supporting our child's education and all of that is in fact true. We should be doing those things, but school is where children learn to read. Home is where children learn to love to read. And that is a very different job for parents. If you think about trying to get your kids to do something, to get through the mechanics, to learn how to do something, that's very different from getting your child to want to do something, to choose to do something, to enjoy something. And so if your child is struggling, for example, to learn how to read in school, the last thing that he's going to want to do is have that experience replicated in ho at home. If he's feeling bad about the fact that he's in group K and everyone else in his class is in group N and then you're forcing him to go through those leveled readers at home, that again, it's, sort of t it's, it's continuing what might be a negative experience. So while he's struggling to learn how to read at school, trust your teacher to do that job. And if you have doubts about it, you can always consult a reading specialist. But what your job as the parent to do is you can offset if that's a negative experience. You can make sure that books are something that are pleasurable, that it's pleasure, not pressure in your home. That when you are with your child at night, rather than have him read you know, and struggle through those Bob books or early leveled readers where they're trying to pronounce and, and sort of connect the dots in, the, in phonics, you can read aloud a picture book to them. And when I, when, one thing that's very important, we'll get to this in the next one, uh, we'll get to it in a, in a couple of minutes, um, but is that children enjoy books in many different ways at the same time. And I'll get to that in a moment. But first, I just want to talk about Harry Potter. A lot of people you know, think that one of the milestones now of childhood is reading Harry Potter aloud to your kids. This is not your job. This is not your parent, the parent's job for a number of reasons. First of all, not everyone loves Harry Potter. I happen to love it, but a lot of kids don't like fantasy or they find the books frightening. But very importantly, J.K. Rowling wrote the first four books as middle grade books, which means they are for ages eight to 12. And the, th the last three books in this series are YA books. They're for 12 and up. She decided to grow the series along with her readers as she was writing in real time. And there's a turning point at the edge of book four where one of the major, main characters, Cedric, I, I hope I'm not no spoilers here, dies. And that's a very traumatizing thing for some children to process. And that's the transition from children's book to young adult book. And not every child is ready for it. And when my kids were little, everyone was showing up like my kid read all seven Harry Potters in kindergarten. And that was sort of the big thing that people were to, wanted to show off about. So if your kid wasn't there yet, what did parents do? They read it aloud to make sure their kids sort of felt like um, they weren't being left behind. But Harry Potter is the dessert. You do not have to feed Harry Potter to your kids. That is a goal for them. That's something to aspire. That's, again, about reading being the reward. If your child wants to read Harry Potter, wait until she's ready to read those books and then let her read them herself. That's, again, why would you give that away? That's a motivator for her. Similarly, there are a lot of series that are really not great reading for parents. And I don't know how many parents of young children there are in this room, but if you're a parent of girls, you probably know Rainbow Fairies. This is a great series for little kids. It is a terrible series for adults. There are about 70,000 of them. They are written by a non-person named Daisy Meadows. She doesn't exist. And like girls who are four, five, six, seven, eight, love them. 
They are torture for a parent to read aloud. Um, the Magic Treehouse, similar, huge long series. Kids love them. Most parents who have to read them aloud want to kind of kill themselves after the fourth book because they all start with the same prologue. Again, I'm not saying anything bad about these books. They serve a function. And the function they serve is that kids love them, and so they want to read in order to read those books. Those are not books that you need to read aloud to kids. And then this gets to the point, which is once they're reading on their own, move on from picture books. This is not true. Picture books should stay in the picture all throughout childhood and beyond. Picture books have their own beauty and their own function. And if people didn't like looking at pictures well into adulthood, there would be no Instagram. So what picture books allow for a child to do is to appreciate a richer vocabulary, to be able to absorb artwork and visuals, to understand how to read pictures, to follow that sequence of events through the art of, of visual storytelling. And if your child is working on a book at school that says, you know, Pat and the cat sat on the mat, chances are his or her brain is well beyond that in terms of what they are interested in with storytelling. And if you say, oh, as soon as you're reading those books on your own, I'm not going to read anymore to you, you're essentially punishing them for becoming an independent reader. And for many kids, especially if they've grown up in a home where reading aloud to your child is a cherished family habit and, and, and pleasure, to sort of pull that from underneath them at the moment that they're reading on their own is really punitive. And moreover, it denies them the opportunity to enjoy books that have a richer vocabulary, that are more visually interesting to them than the kind of early readers that they're getting at school. In a similar way, at the same time that they are struggling through those leveled early readers, you should continue to read aloud non-picture books to them. But if you're reading The Hobbit aloud to them, or Betsy Tacey, or Little House on the Prairie, whatever the series might be, to continue to do that, because kids are like adults. They enjoy storytelling in all of its sort of various ways. And just as many of us, while we might enjoy reading Edith Wharton or Colson Whitehead for fun, we might also occasionally like to read a domestic thriller or a spy novel. We might like to listen to books on audio. So we all like to enjoy books of different kinds at any given moment, and kids are the same way. The best children's books are the classics. Um, so uh, this, again, is kind of a myth. There are great classic books out there for kids. And if you look at the sales of children's books in this country, you will find that the books that continue to outsell all of the new books sort of in the aggregate are the classics. There's a reason why, and it's because when all of us become new parents or new grandparents, we think, oh my god, I can't wait to share Blueberries for Sal, or Dr. Seuss, or Richard Scarry's I Am a Bunny, or whatever our own cherished favorites are from childhood. And there is nothing wrong with that. But I think the reason people go back to that is because they don't know that whole world that's out there. And we are really living in a new golden age for children's books. And I don't just say that because I work at the Book Review, and I didn't just say that as the children's books editor. I was so shocked by how good children's books had become when I was the children's books editor that I asked, at the time I was not the editor of the book review, I asked for more pages. And when I got more pages, I, there were still more books that deserved attention. And I continued to write, actually started writing one online review a week, 52 additional books, just to be able to cover a small sliver of the greatness that's out there. And the books have improved at every age and in every format. So even with something like board books, um, which are those books that kids can chew on. They are now available in many other formats. There are books called Indestructibles. There are books that like are deliberately created to go in the bathtub. There are all kinds of board books. And they are also, because the production has improved so much, and a lot of the printing is done in China, and the ways in which these books can be creative have improved so much, there are things that they can do with cutouts. There are things they can do. It used to be that you would have to abridge a picture book in order to adapt it into a, picture, into a board book format, because the board book couldn't hold as many pages. And now they've improved the production to the point where they don't have to abridge picture books. So they are better than ever. With picture books, I cannot even describe to you. It's, it's, it's such a shame that the book review has to be printed on newsprint, because the glorious illustration and the quality of the stories is truly phenomenal. 
I have to say also that the diversity of the children's books in terms of the kinds of experiences and the children who are depicted in their pages has improved enormously. They reflect the reality of our world today. You cannot publish a picture book today with all white faces. And that's good not only for children of color to see themselves reflected in the pages of the books they read, but it's also good for children who are white and who do not necessarily encounter those experiences in their everyday lives because they will. That's the world that they are coming into. And books, I think, are one of the most powerful paths towards fostering empathy. It's a way in which we can see through other people's eyes, we can see their stories, we can learn about other experiences, and that's something now with picture books that all children can do. They're also much more global, so that we have incredible children's picture books coming from Europe, from Latin America, now starting more and more from Asia. China does not did not have a tradition of picture books, and they have now started, and they are producing really incredible work. And all of that is coming over here. So it's really a world that you're opening up to your kids. In terms of nonfiction, children's books, have gotten incredible. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with biography, and there was a wall in the, pic in the library, in the children's library of biography, and I would go alphabetical, looking for the girls. So I would go from Abigail Adams to Clara Barton to Dolly Madison, and essentially it was all first, wa first ladies and nurses, and that was great. I liked reading about them. There, Helen Keller was the one other exception. But now there are children's biographies of everyone that you can imagine, from artists, to entrepreneurs, to writers, to politicians, to public service, um, people who've excelled in public service, just sports heroes really across the spectrum. And they're highly illustrated and beautifully produced. And they run from really very, you know, quite young. There are lots of board books. You might have seen some of these sort of hero books for very young children going up through picture books for older kids, for kids who are more visual readers, who appreciate seeing rich photography. And the photography that's produced in all of these books, again, because of the lowered printing costs and production in Asia, is just gotten much better. So that a book of photographs that used to be you know, unaffordable for most kids in the 70s or 80s, now you have places like National Geographic here in Washington producing incredible photography books for kids. And then there are lots of books that, and in terms of middle grade, that really reflect the world in which kids are living now. Another category I want to talk about is young adult books. When I was a kid, young adult didn't exist. You basically went from Sweet Valley High, and then you would leapfrog into like Sidney Sheldon and V.C. Andrews' Flowers in the Attic, which is about incest. There were no books for teenagers. And now there's a whole category that has arisen of books for teenagers that in all their incarnations really reflect kids' experiences and desires. And the way in which these writers work is truly remarkable because they know what they're up against. They are up against TikTok. They're up against Fortnite. They're up against Instagram. And so these writers go for your heartstrings. If you, as an adult, have not read John Green's The Fault in Our Stars, which is, you know, I think most people know about two cancer patients who fall in love and don't cry, you basically do not have a heart. <laughs> These books tap into the immediacy and the intensity of adolescent emotion in a way that books just didn't do at all when I was growing up. And then in terms of fantasy, these are plotty driven, you know, very plot driven books because the writers know that if they don't grab you by page two, they've lost you. They've lost you to the internet or Hulu or Netflix or Amazon or wherever else kids will go and spend their free time. So what does a parent do to raise a reader? I'm going to run through some quick tips. I've covered some of them here. Um, but just to give you some sort of big ideas and then very specific things that you can do. So reading should be fun. It should not be a chore. Reading is a pleasure. Oh, let me go back. Ah, OK, we have the abbreviated version. Um, I have many tips for all of these. But again, what, I wanna, what I'll say quickly about reading should be fun is that you're not their teacher. So don't treat reading in the home like a chore. Treat it like something that is special. And I will give you just one example, a practical tip that, I, that uh, we used in my home, which is that we told our kids when they were growing up that, or, well, they're still growing up. They're now 10, 13, and 14, so they have a ways to go. But when they were younger, we would set a bedtime, let's say 7 o'clock. But then we would say, if you want to stay up 
in bed quietly reading. You can stay up until 7.30. So what that tells them is that reading is a, is a privilege. Reading is something you get to do because you're older. And when 7.30 comes along, they don't say, can I stay up late? They say, can I just finish this chapter? Can I please just finish this page? I'm almost done with the book. So you are sort of training them in a way to want to read, to view reading in that positive light. Another big idea that, oops. Everyone learns to read. Again, everyone learns to read. You are not there as their taskmaster. You can do a lot to help a child learn to read. But remember, the more they are reading at home, the more that will ultimately help them read at school, especially if you start it early on. So do trust teachers to handle the nuts and bolts of reading. Let kids go at their own pace. Let them make mistakes. You don't have to correct them when they're reading. In fact, if you make a mistake, that's a good thing. It's good for them to see that this is an imperfect process. I think, frankly, a lot of parents, after a long day working in the office, are exhausted. I flubbed over many words as I was tiredly reading to my kids at the end of a work day. Kids appreciate seeing that adults make mistakes, too. Create a family culture around reading. This is really important. So when you're at the family table for dinner, you can talk about the books you're reading, not just what you're binge watching on Netflix. You can watch movies based on books together. You can show off your own reading. I mean, it's a very strong message to kids when they all say, oh, we want, well, we're going to watch a movie now. Do you want to come? If you say, you know what? No, I'm really into my book. I'd rather finish what I'm reading. That sends a message to them. It's also really important that if you set rules around screens in your home, if, for example, you say all screens away in a public, in a, you know, public area at 8 PM, that you follow that yourself, which I know can be very hard for adults. But if you're sitting there saying, hey, guys, it's time to read, and you're scrolling on your phone, that's sending a really mixed message. So it's important for parents to be part of this, too. Show books some respect. So one thing I love, and we have a whole area in the book, a uh, chapter in the book on this, is ways in which to incorporate books as part of your family culture. One thing, for example, that grandparents can do is that rather, and I think, frankly, most parents would welcome this, rather than get your child a big toy or gift card when it's their birthday, give them a book. Personally inscribe it to them from the moment they're born. Create an, a library of books that's just the books that they got from grandma or from grandpa that becomes their library from zero onwards. Donate books, inscribe books to your kids, teach them to treat them with respect, teach them to donate them to the library, to donate them to school book fairs, and then let them show how books are made, what's behind it. Take them to readings, allow them to see the process behind books. When I was at the National Book Festival, I was really worried because they had this one big room for the largest, you know, sort of greatest authors. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the speaker. And she had like a full house with something like 7,000 people on a waiting list. And then one of the other people who was going to be in that room was Raina Telgemeier, who is a very popular graphic novelist. And I worried that she wouldn't fill up the room. Well, I needn't have worried because her latest book, which is called Guts, which deals with children's anxiety, hit number one on Amazon before it came out and was number one on Amazon for like a week after that. A huge success with kids. And the room was filled to overflow. And one of the things she did in that session was to show a slideshow of the books and the artwork she had created as a child and about how her process worked as a graphic novelist, drawing and writing the text for her books. And kids were wrapped to see what that process was like. Let your child take charge. So you want to make sure that your child is allowed to maintain control over his or her own bookshelf. Let them reread them. Don't judge what they're reading. Don't just say, you know, ugh, that book again, even if that's what you're secretly thinking. Allow them to feel your enthusiasm and support and respect for their own choices. And I will end with an image. This is actually the bookshelf of one of uh, my co-author, who also has three kids, one of her son's uh, bookshelves, which he has arranged very deliberately um, according to his own interests. And she is not allowed to touch them, which is as it should be. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I welcome Naomi's questions and then okay. hopefully questions from all of you. Great. Well, thank you. That was, that was well, wonderful. Um, and you can find many more, many more tips in the book. Uh, and what I particularly liked as a parent of three children myself is that a lot of the book has um, recommendations for um, sort of your, your, uh, 
your role as a book concierge. You know, if your child is obsessed with Harry Potter, they might also like this. Um, so it, it, it's helpful in that way too. But I wanted to talk about um, maybe just a couple minutes on the, the question of you know, the, the competing things. I mean, our, our kids don't have a lot of free time. And so it feels um, very difficult to kind of set aside reading time because there's so many other, you know, you have um, whether it's structured sports activities or schoolwork or other, other obligations that kids have. And how do you sort of create that, that time in your home and sort of make that a priority for kids when it seems like everything else comes first? Well, yeah, it's a challenge for everyone because as you said, there are extracurricular activities, there's lots of homework, and then there are all the myriad distractions, many of them on screens that tug at our children's time and attention. And that's why, again, I stress the making, child, making books become something that kids want to do because ultimately a lot of this is going to come down to their choice, particularly as they get older. And that's when you start to see a lot of fall off. And that's when also the messaging that we as parents and our schools send to kids is really important. One thing I find very distressing is that when you look at children's libraries in schools, the libraries in the elementary schools will be incredibly rich. And then come middle school, they're turned into media centers and computers mm -hmm. take the priority. And a lot of the books are being stripped out and the librarians being let go, which I think is a mistake because what we're trying to do is encourage enthusiasm. But I don't think of it as carving out a time for reading. I honestly do think that, that it's always time to read a book. Um, and my kids are sort of always sort of shoving it into the nooks and crannies, the little moments that they have in between everything else. Um, and that's honestly, you know, ideally what you want. Um, because to sort of set it aside, again, it kind of creates this idea of, of a task, of right. something that has to be done. And so I urge right, the parents. Reading, the reading logs that the reading uh, you talk logs, about as yes. parents. So like, oh, 20 home. minutes a night. You know, again, that's, it's a very different kind of mindset. And so I urge parents to really think about this. I hate to say it, but in the same manipulative way that parents think about like peas and violin practice, you really have to think about how do I create intrinsic motivation as opposed to extrinsic rewards, punishments, or inducements, because ultimately it's going to be that kid's choice. And so from an early age, I would say that even if you have, for example, a set bedtime routine where you're reading to them before bed every night, make sure that's not the only time. Right. So it's good for kids to have that practice because it's also especially good for kids to wind down to a book um, and to stay off a screen, keep screens out of the bedroom. But you also want to make sure that they're reading in the morning when they wake up, that they're reading in between doing their other things. So it's things like, again, always carrying books with you. It's when you're going on vacation as a family, asking everyone, hey, what books are you bringing? I mean, again, little sort of mind twi mindset twists of being like, you know what? We are not buying books on this trip. So if you don't bring enough books and you run out, it's on you. You know, and we, have, again, we have the opposite <laughs> problem, which is that we that I, I always give in at the bookstore. So that's sort of my well, our family policy is um, I don't necessarily spoil them with everything else, but um, but I usually walk out of the bookstore with quite a big bill. So. Well, you know, I do too. <laughs> um, you know, and again, that's another thing that you can do, which is that look, we're not buying souvenirs, but we will always get you books from another country. So we'll find an English language bookstore, or if you're in the states or somewhere in an English-speaking country, we'll make sure that we go to a bookstore, and I'll let you each pick out three books when we get there. But you know, that kind of thing, where that becomes part of what your family does, and you know, there are ways in which to arrange travel around that. Um, there are, you know, again, does your kid need a battery? pack for his iPhone when you go on vacation? Maybe not. Maybe let it run out of batteries and make sure that everyone brings a book with them every time they leave the house. Make sure, you know, again, no parent likes to have stuff scattered in the back of their cars, but better that it be books that are sort of sitting in the back of the car than a bunch of random plastic, you know, toys that they've gotten. So I think that they're, I think that ideally you don't really want to have a set time for reading. You yeah. want to create an atmosphere in which they're looking for that time. And, and I can say this because I'm not the editor of a book review. I also encourage my kids to read children's book reviews now. The, my kids are 12, 10, and 7. And so the 12 and the 10-year-old, actually, I encourage them to read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times' children's book section so that they can tell me if there's a book that they are interested in and want to order. And they can kind of get into like almost being a professional book reviewer themselves. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's a great way to empower kids. I mean, I've had moments where I've said to 
you know, at moments where I felt like my kids didn't know what to read, I might say, okay, well, here are six books I think you might like. Why don't you pick the one that you want to you know, choose? Again, letting them take the lead, and then give me a review. Um, and obviously, I had a kind of professional uh, advantage when I was the children's books editor, because I would bring home a bunch of books from work, um, and they, I would say, okay, let me know if these are any good, yeah. um, so that I know whether we should cover them or not. Good. All right, well, I wanted to open it up for questions if there are any um, either, on the, either on specific uh, book issues or on the culture of, of bringing reading into your home. All right. Go ahead. Hold on. Who's your favorite children's book illustrator? That is not an easy one. That's a very difficult one. Um, I have so many. It's really hard to choose. Um, I will just mention one person who is a really um, uh, versatile illustrator, and he is also a comic books artist. His name is Patrick McDonald. And I think my favorite book by him is called Me, dot, 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 Jane. And it's about the childhood of Jane Goodall and about how she grew up, and it in incorporates drawings of Jane Goodall that Jane Goodall did from her own notebooks as a child, how she grew up observing the world around her, and how that led her to become a scientist. And it ends with a reproduction of that famous image of Jane, that photograph of her reaching out to a baby chimpanzee, and the chimpanzee reaching back to her to touch her hand. And like, I, I cry every time I get to that final spread. But what I think is so beautiful about that book is it's, very, it's for very young children, and it really gets to what the way in which children think about the world around them. It starts off with the famous story of Jane going into the chicken coop to see like how do the eggs come to be, um, the kind of questions that all children ask. Um, but what I also think is really beautiful about that book is it's about nature and close observation and direct experience. It's very off screen. Um, but what Patrick McDonald does on the other end of the spectrum, he does incredibly funny books. He has a book called A Perfectly Messed Up Story, and it's about a little kind of, I don't know, unidentifiable creature. I don't know if it's a dog or a cat or a, a bear, sort of wandering along and being, and it's, it's told in this kind of very nice, upbeat way, like, Jack, I can't remember the character's name, but you know, was having a really wonderful day, and you know, he was going along, and everything was sunny and bright, and then all of a sudden, a blob of jelly lands on the page, uh, and sort of breaks the fourth wall, and the character is really upset by the fact that this splotch of jelly is um, interrupting his story and ruining it. Um, and kids love that story. I'm a big fan of books that make kids laugh. I think that for any kind of what we call reluctant reader, um, I think there's a lot of concern around boys in reading. And as the mother of two sons, I definitely um, you know, can, can, can understand why, because my sons are readers, but not a lot of boys are. And the statistics around boys in reading are alarming. One really great way in for boys especially is humor. So I am really uh, respond well to any book that, uh, that, that makes a kid laugh. Why do you think, I was curious when you were talking about how this is the golden age Age of children's books, um, it seems paradoxical that we're sort of experiencing, you know, fewer and fewer kids want to read for pleasure, or seem to be reading for pleasure, but there seems to be so much out there for them. Why, why do you see this golden age? What do you think is behind it? Um, well, you know what, let me continue just to talk about the boys for one sure. second, because I think it's important, and I didn't touch on it earlier, which is that when you look around statistics of boys and, and reading, and this will come around to, to answer your question, um, boys read far less than girls. They are less likely in national surveys to say that reading is a favorite activity for them. They read fewer books over the summer. Many of them don't read a single book over the summer. So I want to couple those statistics with two other things that we know from national surveys. One is that kids of both genders say that they are less likely to see their father's reading than their mother's reading. And again, this gets back to role models. It's really important to set role models, um, that both parents set role models of reading to their kids. And that secondly, both parents, both mothers and fathers, are less likely to read to their sons than to their daughters. And so I want to get back to that, answer your question. One of the things is that people have observed this, and there are a lot more books 
for boys because there's a wider recognition of the many different ways in which kids read. And some kids are more kinetic readers. They're more visual readers. A lot of parents of young boys will say, my kid can't sit st still while he's reading. OK. Well, then there are great interactive books. There are pop-up books. There are books with tabs and things to do. Um, and I'm not talking about electronic buttons embedded in books. There are just books that allow kids to, to sort of get in there. And I also say to them, it's OK if your kid's wandering around the room while you're reading. If they want to see what's in the picture, they'll come back. And mostly they do, because the pictures are telling their own story. Mm -hmm. There are also graphic novels are another great way to get boys. Um, there, when I talked about those National Geographic books, a lot of those books are 101 wacky facts about animals or 100 great sports moments. Those are books. And it's really important that if your child gravitates toward those books, and many boys do, and girls, but boys talking about now, not to judge them, not to say, oh, that's just a graphic novel, or those are just comics. Because many of us, great, I mean, when you look at the great authors, and we ask them this question in, in, in the Times regularly and by the book, what did you read growing up? Many great novelists grew up reading superhero comics, reading The Peanuts, reading Calvin and Hobbes. So you know, everyone can still enjoy those books and then grow to appreciate Tolstoy and Edith Wharton in adulthood. You know, it doesn't prevent <laughs> you. Um, so there are a lot more books out there for those kinds that have of readers. They've tried to solve that problem for yes, people. Yes, yeah. And That's I think graphic novels, again, you might look down at Dogman and Captain Underpants, and I did before I looked into them. And now I don't look down on those books. I look up to those books. Those books are doing something really incredible, which is that those books, the Wimpy Kid books, the Captain Underpants, they're getting kids to read who probably otherwise wouldn't read. And if those kids love those books, they will then move on to other books. And so again, I think there's a recognition and a catering to a greater variety of, of, of readers. Other questions? Um, one, of the, one of the other things actually I wanted to sort of pick your brain about, you mentioned you, the, the new sort of newish YA category. And so uh, my older two have sort of gotten more into the YA category now. And I'm um, and uh, some of the material feels to me totally inappropriate yes. for, um, for, for even, you know, for kids who are ostensibly the target for it. So I'm trying to figure out, like, what makes a book a YA book and, um, and, and how we can sort of figure out, um, you know, what, what is maybe we need two YA categories or something <laughs> like that um, if a parent is not going to read every YA book before handing them over to a child. So, you know, I think a lot about what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, and I veer towards allowing them to read inappropriate books. And I have to, I do this for a number of reasons because if you're trying to get kids to read a book, there's nothing to induce, especially a teenager, more than to say that book isn't appropriate right. for you. If you really want your teenager to read a book, tell them that they can't. They will read that book. And I have to say, again, if they're going to learn about something dangerous, if they're going to learn about something unknown, something you think that is beyond their years, and my kids have done it all, and I could share really kind of semi-horrifying stories, the way I console myself is this. Would you rather them read it in a book that has been carefully looked at, rewritten, written again, edited, overseen by people, making sure not to upset, not to offend, to cater to the academic market, to the institutional market, or would you rather them go online and Google it? Right. No, so, and, and not just that, but I think also just the, the book experience allows them to process it in a way that seeing it on a screen or in a movie oh, or absolutely. something like that, I think, takes a lot more time. Like my kids, you know, when they have seen something sort of scary or inappropriate or something, they're much more likely to, you know, have the nightmare about the movie than tell me they're having nightmares because they read something scary in a book that happened. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, again, upsetting. and this is talking about a culture of readers. So, like, it enables you to have a conversation with your kid about it. Because remember this, too, is that kids of all ages very often find it easier to talk about a difficult situation or emotion or experience when it's not about them. It's about someone else. So if it's about a character in a book, they can talk about it that way. If there's something they're worried about, but they aren't able to talk about it in terms of their, themselves, they can be like, there's a character in this book that's cutting themselves. Like, I don't understand what that means. And I remember a very like nerve-wracking moment when my daughter was only 10 years old. She came downstairs. She was reading a middle grade book. That's a book for kids ages 8 to 12. And she said, what does this word mean? And she pointed to the word, and it was heroin. And I thought, oh, I did not know we were going to have that conversation yet. 
Um, well, my, my son reads books about um, sports figures and sports history, so the drug conversation, the, the history <laughs> comes up far sooner than, than that. Your child yes, may have exactly. had it younger than mine. But you know, the reason why it was in that book is because the character in that book had a sister who was an opioid addict. And that's an issue that affects a lot of Americans. And if you think about those Americans who have that situation in their family lives or in their communities, to see that in a book, to see it handled sensitively and in context, that is hugely powerful to that child to see something that might be upsetting or disturbing to them handled in a way. And so for my daughter, it was completely new. And I had to you know, be like, yeah. well. Um, <laughs> but again, I think that, that I would rather her learn about it there than yeah. in somewhere that you know, I have zero control over. And again, that she's not going to come to me necessarily and say, what is this? Yeah. Because for a child to Google something online, some they're like, uh-oh, I don't think I should have seen that. They're not going to bring it up with you necessarily. But if a book is something they know that they talk to you about what they read, that's what your family does, then they're naturally going to come to a parent ask. I, just one, one last question I have for you. I noticed that you suggested one of the tips in passing was that reading should not be competitive. Um, and so much of what we are trying to induce our kids to do, we use competition as a way for that to happen among siblings, like you know, who can you know, read the most books or who can, you know, what, whatever it is. And I was wondering why you think that's particularly harmful in the context of reading? Well, so again, it's a, it's a little bit about extrinsic rewards about like, and, and not about intrinsic rewards. And I think, you know, you have three children, and so you know this too. I mean, I had to, my first child was a girl, my second was a boy, and when I was pregnant with my third, I thought, is he going to be like this one or that one? You know, not really, of course, he's just a totally different child. Um, and there are all three really different readers really different readers, so there's no competition in a way. My daughter reads for comfort. She reads really trashy stuff, um, but she also will read um, history, and you know, right now she, she was given in school um, Andrew Solomon's excellent book, Far From the Tree, the young adult version, and then she thought, I'm ditching this and I want to read the real book the real book. Um, so she's reading oh, the adult pages book. Of it, yeah. yeah, my middle child loves classics. Anything that had the Newberry seal, he wanted to read it. Um, he is also, he's 13, he's mostly reading adult books. But what was interesting with him too is that he would read books, he read the Jungle Books, for example, the Rudyard Kipling, and then he came away with this. And this is where I you know, tell parents to trust kids because he came back and he said, you know, these books haven't aged very well. Um, and uh, there's a lot of really kind of racist stuff in here. And I thought that's really interesting. And you know, some people will say, well, you know, then don't give your kids those books. Protect them from them. But I think that kids, many kids can handle it. And you know your child best, so you know the kinds of things that they can process. And then my younger child likes to read like science encyclopedias, which I just, the last thing I want to read. Um, and, and, and my other two wouldn't want to read that. So again, I try to think of it as they're all really different. You don't want to set them against each other. And what you want, don't want to do with kids is to have one child label themselves, well, I'm just not a reader. Like so and so is so good. She's the reader, um, and but to say like, well, no, because you're reading all these different kinds of books. You're reading these fact books, and maybe she's reading these long novels. But this is what you do, so you don't want it to turn. Yeah, we into have that. that we have of... this sort of like uh, each kid has different tastes, and so sometimes they have arguments over whether the other sibling might like such a book because, of course, they only read that kind of book, and right. then the other sibling will get upset and be like, well, no, I I like those kind of books too. But well, you know, and again, <laughs> another way to sort of empower your kids and to foster a sort of more cooperative way of, of doing it is that as each of my kids has sort of weeded books out of their room, because um, as you can imagine it, given my profession, they get a lot of books, um, they have to go through them. And I ask them, weed out your books. Which ones do you think should go to this kid? Which ones do you think should go to this kid? Which ones do you think should go to a cousin? Because you don't think either of your brothers will be into it. And they actually really love that process of thinking like, oh, I'm the older brother or sister, mm -hmm. and I kind of know the younger one better, and I'm going to give him the, these books. And it, then it becomes something that I think fosters a kind of different atmosphere around it. All right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Pamela and Paul for joining us today. And uh, thanks again so much.